Whiskey Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American over here in Germany, often tasting rare and exotic whiskeys. I'm not really sure how rare and exotic this one is. Glenmorangie, A Tale of Winter, Highland Single Malt, Scotch Whiskey, Mazala Wine Cask Finish. Ooh. Now, um, there's actually a nice little picture, and I think there might actually be a video, where you see Dr. Bill Lumpton. He's responsible for Glenmorangie and Artbeck from Louis Vuitton. Um, the, both are um, whiskey companies, and he's actually wearing a jumper, a... Um, a self-knit sweatshirt actually in that pattern. So now I decided to celebrate uh, winter Christmas in the summer of 2022. I'm late with this video, so I say, hey, why not just go f f lean into it and let's celebrate winter, a tale of winter in the summer. Now this was um, released in October of 2021. So we are now very rapidly approaching that moment of 2022. And I thought it would be just interesting to actually review this now because there are a lot of bottles still in the shops. And there's a good reason for that, in my opinion. And so there might be the need for Glen Morangi to push this um, in this fall and winter again. And I think maybe it'd be good that a few of us remember what this whiskey is all about. All right, so I'm going to compare it. Of course I am to something that I actually very much like, and that's the Glenmorangie 10. Now over here in Germany, I can still get this bottle for 30, under 35 euros. This is a 10 year old age statement, single malt whiskey from a very, in my opinion, respectable distillery, Glenmorangie. Now um, this is 40%, this is 46. Uh, this is chill filtered. The tale of um, the winter, the tale of winter, we don't know. Nowhere in any of the press releases I found or on the box or on the bottle is there any mention of non gel filtration. What a shame. And there is no mention of natural color. We might assume, since it's 46%, that it is non gel filtered, that it's natural color. But nowhere on any of the labels or on the press releases were there any mention of that whatsoever. Come on, Glamoranji. I think you can do better. Yeah, so don't leave us in the dark. If it is chill filtered, if it is added color, tell us. And if it isn't, we will applaud you for doing it correctly. So we assume that it isn't if it's not on there. So put the natural color, put the non-chilled filtered somewhere in the label. There's more than enough room. All right, so this is 35, less than 35 euros. This is whiskey base number 186566. And it is a 13-year-old whiskey. So, Dr. Bill Lumpton talked about his strategy at working at the um, Glenmorangie Distillery. He groomed someone to be his successor, and that successor um, abandoned him <laughs> and went to distill, not naming any names. And so he is now maybe looking for someone else to invest in to show how to make great whiskey. Because what he does at Glenmorangie is he always takes this as his base. So basically, except the Glenmorangie X, there is not a whiskey out there that's younger than 10 years of age. And um, they make a very, very good 10-year-old whiskey, personal opinion. And so this was a 10-year-old, maybe a little bit older, and they actually put it in Mazala cask. From, where does Mazala come from? It comes from Sicily, way down there at the boot of Italy, that island. Now, there's a nice little story about Mazala. It's a fortified wine, and what we have is a guy here named John Woodhouse. He was an English trader. He was actually in Sicily, and in 1773, um, he landed at the port of Mazala and discovered the local wine produced in that region, which was aged in wooden casks and tasted similar, in his opinion, to sherry from Spain and the, fortify, the fortified wine from Portugal called Port. And they were very pop popular in English. So, and fortified mazala was and is made using a process which is very, very similar to the Celera systems. And so it's actually called Perpetium. And so they actually go through different casks. Uh, the younger stuff comes in the top, the older stuff comes, at, comes out of the bottom and so on. 
and he recognized that this process actually raised the alcohol level and the alcoholic taste of the wine while pre preserving the characteristics during the long uh, travel distance back to um, England. So, John Woodhouse was very, very right. Um, the the Mazala was a big hit in um, England and the UK. And so he actually went back then to Sicily. And he, in 1796, so almost 30 years later, um, I'm sorry, 20 years later, he actually started buying up a lot of land, started making his own um, Mazala wine and exporting it back over to the UK, as well as the Americas. So, now what we have here is a great, great um, vineyard, and what happened was in 1833, there was an entrepreneur, um, his name was Florio, if you've ever heard Florio and uh, connection with Mazala, you have learned about Mazala. Um, he took over uh, the vineyards from Woodhouse, and he had his own, and so there's just two big names in the uh, Mazala industry today, it's Pellegrino, and it's also then Florio. Now, all that background information, all that history um, about Mazala, we have no idea where these casks exactly came from, what, what vineyard. So, now I poured this in the glass and I must admit there's something that bothers me. What bothers me, I get a sulfur moment aroma. So what do I mean with sulfur? Do I mean like um, rotten eggs? No. I mean you're at the camp, you're at the campsite, you have the safety matches and you light the match. And that moment of sulfur, phosphor, acidity, um, that, that moment is what I'm getting here. Now where does that come from? If you empty a cask, um, let's say it's a Mazala cask, which I don't think is really necessary with a 20 some percent ABV between 15 and 20. Um, and you transport that, especially in the hot climate from Sicily, which is often hot, up over Europe in a container, all the way over then to the UK, up to Scotland, where this was therefore filled in that Mazana cask. Um, what you do to prevent that cask from actually going bad is you put actually a sulfur candle in there. That sulfur oxide actually then... Um, that air displaces a lot of that oxygen that can cause um, the rest alcohol and the rest um, mazala wine in there to go bad. Um, it prevents that and therefore they do it. Unfortunately, that sulfur oxide moment actually absorbs in the wood. And as soon as you put something else in that cask, let's say a Glenmorangie 10 year old, and you let it sit for two and a half, three years, you get a lot of sulfur. Now, some people are very sulfur insensitive. They don't smell it at all. I've given my, I, 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 ooh, sulfur. And then somebody else went, Jason, I only get honey and berries and whatever else. And it's like, I don't get any of that. I get sulfur. And it's for me as if someone's playing a uh, very, very loud music and in the background there's someone speaking. And it's at, a, it's at that one pitch and it's just over um, and out performs everything else and other people can just tune it out or don't even recognize that pitch and I do unfortunately and so this is really really not my cup of tea now there is a red berry moment going on here think a little bit of a cross between a Hawaiian punch cranberry and a little bit of current all right so you get a little bit about that touch that's going that's what this um, mazala should be like now there's official press release here. Dr. Bill Lumsden, the director of Whiskey Creation said, we all know how wonderful it is to sit in front of a pirate fireplace when it's snowing outside. There are, aroma, uh, there are um, aromas that are so colorful, so lively, um, just like my uh, favorite jumper, my favorite knitted sweatshirt. And um, the Glenmorangie, A Tale of Winter, actually catches those uh, magical, um, beautiful moments, this fruit, the honey, together with a little bit of cacao, red pepper, a little bit of a pepper nut coffee going on there. And then has a long finish 
with a little bit of cinnamon, ginger, and also cloves that are like snowflakes whirling together. So that's almost embarrassing. Um, the text, the press release was translated into German. I had the German text in front of me and I had to spontaneously translate it, translate it back to English. So maybe I got 95% right here. All right. And so I don't get any snowflakes. I don't get any of that wonderful fruity, um, moments here, but I do, if I go over to the 10 year old, I must admit, I like this. I get, I get malty, vanilla, honey with Almond marzipan. Now, my question of the day, if you had, I said 35 euros, let's say you have 40 euros to spend, and you're looking for an alternative in the Highland, Speyside type of flavor profile. We want it to be an authentic whiskey. Um, authentic, yeah, um, um, authentic whiskey with hopefully 46%, non-chilled filtered, no natural color, and hopefully an age statement. What whiskey would you take instead? I really have my problems. I don't want a sherry bomb. I don't want an Isla. I don't want anything with peat. I just want a really solid, good 10-year-old single malt whiskey that can stand up to Glenmorangie and say, hey, I'm actually the same price or nominally more expensive, and I do it right. So, which one? Which one can you recommend at that price? So I'm happy with this. I actually am. I'm going to buy another bottle of this, and when this is done, I'm going to buy another bottle and so on. I had my sister-in-law here once, and we had a little bit of a time, and so I said, hey, would you like to do a little like a private little whiskey tasting? She said, yeah, great. So um, she doesn't drink whiskey, so I said, all right, good. I'm going to start you off with a nice... Uh, I think my old nice whiskey and I gave her the Glenmorangie. She was like, eh, that's okay. And I gave her a little bit of um, 50% um, bottle and bond bourbon. She was like, okay. And then I was like, okay, good. I'll give you an odd big tent. She was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> I was like, all right, I don't understand some people. So there was, she didn't like whiskey, but the odd big ten was like, oh, you got more of this? <laughs> I actually gave her the rest. I only had a little bit of my bottle left. I just gave her the whole bottle. She was so happy. She said, this is a fan. This is the whiskey I love. And so different people, different strokes, different things going on here. All right. Sulfur. Sulfur, get a little bit of that red currant, a little bit of that cranberry in there, a little bit of that um, raspberry, a little bit of that red berries going on there, more sulfur, a little bit of wood, tiny little bit of bitterness, more, more sulfur. This is just that boom, boom, boom moment that keeps on going. Now, this whiskey in Germany costs 35 euros. This whiskey is exactly the same at the base the first 10 years. So now it ups the percentage of alcohol. So let's say this is 40%, it is. Let's say this was even 48%. So that would mean it's 20% more alcohol. Yeah, from 40 to 44 would have been 10, 48 is 20%. So let's say this is 40 euros. So I'm gonna actually say, imagine this bottle now at 48% or 46% would now cost 48 euros. All right, so we have to fill this into a new cask. So we need to go buy the first, the best, the uh, first class, the top of the line, Mazala casks. Now I've bought some casks before and I'm gonna buy some casks again. And I know you can get a Mazala cask for well under a, th a thousand euros. The first fill Mazala cask, 250 liters, um, a barrique, uh, usually American oak, sometimes European oak, but they're gonna be about, let's just say for the sake of arguing a thousand euros. All right, so out of a 250 liter cask, finishing cask, after two and a half years, three years max, I can still get at 48% or 46 in this case, about 300 bottles. All right, 300 times 0 0.7, I add some water, it's 210, I still have enough, I still have 40 liters gone for angel share, which is a lot. 
So if I take 300 bottles from a 1,000 liter cask, extra money involved here, that is going to be three euros and 33 cents. So just say the extra cask actually added a price of 10 euros. You know, I'm rounding up. All right, so we round up for the alcohol, 48 euros. We add, I'm gonna add another 12 euros here to the cask finish because you have manpower, you have to transport the cask from Sicily all the way up to Scotland. You have to fill it in, you have to take it out, you have to have a little bit more warehouse space and so on. So we are at 60 euros. This bottle retails at 89.99. So there's 30 euros someplace that I don't understand. Did the graphic designer get 30 euros for this? I sure do not hope so. Sure don't hope so. Where, where's the money? Where's the value for money? I just find this totally, dramatically overpriced. I can almost get three of these, which I really like, for one of these, which I don't like. Now, if I look at the shops here, I will see that there's a whole lot of shops in Europe that actually have this whiskey on sale. Yeah, I can name, I can, sh 90 different shops all over Europe have this whiskey. And I'm fairly sure that there will be a 750 milliliter bottle. There is, and it's made its way to America as well. And there it costs about $100. Here it costs about 90 euros. And there's a lot of shops in America that still have this. I don't think that this is the whiskey to be buying for that $100, 90 euro price tag. For me, my personal opinion, I have a bad relationship with whiskeys that have that sulfur moment. I'm giving this a D. The value for money, I'm giving an F. This would have to blow me out of the water to actually in any way justify a price tag of 90 euros. Yes, I do know, Jason, it's a 13-year-old whiskey. Yes, I do know that I've said many a times, 10 euros per, per year is absolutely okay. So this might actually have to be 130 euro whiskey, but it doesn't taste like it. This is not a hundred dollar year whiskey, nor is this a hundred year, 130 euro whiskey. If this was 69 euros, eh, okay. But at 89 and I've seen other people going for a hundred and plus. Now I understand why it's still in the shops. All right. Glen Morangi, many things they do are very interesting and very good. But every once in a while, a tale of winter, for example, um, they just don't hit the nail on the head. Um, a tale of cake didn't like that either. Whiskey Jason here, whiskey from the viewpoint of an American over here in Germany. Which whiskey would you buy instead for about $40, 40 euros, 40 um, um, pounds that has an age statement, that is non-chilled filtered, that is natural color, and that you can recommend um, as a representative of Highlands or Speyside whiskey? Thank you very much. All the best. See you soon. Don't forget to share and tell other people about this crazy guy over in Europe tasting a lot of whiskey. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you.